God's Word brings people to faith, it enables people to grow in faith, and it encourages people in turn to share their faith. The grass withers, the flower falls, but the Word of the Lord will stand forever. Christianity is about the wonder of what Christ has done. He loved you before the dawn of time. The answer to our broken world is found only one place, at the cross of Jesus Christ. The apostolic gospel, this once-for-all gospel, this faith, isn't a loose association of ideas. It's not a concept that can be reimagined and can be reconfigured in relationship to the peculiar challenges of the day and of the time. There is only one gospel. This is a matter that is absolutely crucial. It's the kind of thing that you get where Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, where we have the great uh, chapter on the resurrection that Jesus has triumphed over uh, uh, the grave. He's the only one that has done it. Muhammad didn't do it. We would have to say that. And they would have to be honest and tell me, no, I know he didn't. Uh, Jesus was buried, but they could never find him because he rose again. Either that is part of the faith, now, I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the gospel I preach to you, 1 Corinthians 15, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. That's striking. He's not, he's not actually just disbursing some a vague notion about religiosity or spirituality or whatever it might be, many of the sort of contemporary ways we look at these things. No, it's very, very different from that. And the thing that makes it so striking is because of the relativism of our age, because the immediate reaction of friends, understandably because of the way the last 50 years or so has gone, people will say, well, surely that can't be the case. Aren't we agreed that all faiths are equally valid? Aren't we happy to accommodate everyone and anyone? Surely no one is going to claim once for all authority. Now, let me tell you something, and you can read history and find this out. The shift from the faith, the faith, to faith signals the beginning of the end of any church, or any, de any denomination, or any intellectual institution. Read history, and realize that with some help from Scotland, I have to let you know that with some help from Scotland, Harvard, Princeton, Dartmouth, and Yale once began at the very core of it with a training of ministers for the gospel for the one gospel, the faith, once delivered to the saints, once for all. That's where they began. Today, without being unkind in any way, they are far removed from their roots in historic orthodoxy. Now, this is what Jude is saying here. This is his appeal. I appeal to you, I beseech you, that you will contend for these things, that you will be prepared to make a robust statement in the time in which you live. Now, the attack that comes is multivarious, but largely on two fronts. People would attack it by way of deletion. We don't have to be so bold. We don't have to be so firm. We believe in the resurrection, but we don't need everybody to believe in the resurrection. We believe in the purity of the Scriptures, but people have various ideas of the Scriptures, and so it goes on. And any part of the overarching truth of the gospel that is embarrassing in a culture will, unless people are absolutely convinced and prepared to contend, will gradually slip away. Now, just before I, I came here, I, I found um, a piece by a gentleman I've never met before. Michael's his name. He's the president of the American Baptist Churches of Connecticut. And um, he actually took on the question of uh, Prince Charles, now King Charles, the faith versus faith, 
the big question in the coronation. What does he really mean when he says what he says in the coronation oath? But this fellow has, has uh, deconstructed it to this point. He says, if, if King Charles must become defender of something, make him defender of humanity, defender of human dignity, defender of justice. But all that may be just a grade too steep for the new monarch to climb. It is very good that the king, when he was Prince of Wales, not only extolled the virtues of environmental health, but also led initiatives to combat climate change. And as a lover of the environment, King Charles III might still sell, serve the world well, were he to at least become defender of the earth. And people will read that, and they go, that makes perfect sense. After all, he just wrote a book for children, so that children may, from the age of three, four, five, be confronted by the great apocalyptic catastrophe that is apparently before us if we don't all turn immediately green. So you've got children going to their beds at night saying, will, will the Cuyahoga River swallow us up? What is going to happen to us? Will I be awake in the morning? Yes, we can say. Why? Because we have a Bible. Set the Bible aside, and you may find yourself wondering, along with your children. Are you still with me? Calvin says, if we consider what schemes the evil one employs to divert the faith, what was a useful warning in the time of Jude is more than necessary in our age. What age? The 17th century. Loved ones, you are sensible people. You have to read your Bibles. You've got to think this stuff out. But I would wager that evangelicalism, of which we are a part, if there is such an ism, evangelicalism is probably more non-theological at this point in history than at any other point in history. More non-theological so that you will even find those who are supposed to be the teachers of the faith in seminaries, teachers of the faith in churches, playing fast and loose with the very issues. It's one of the reasons that Jude is one of the most neglected books in the Bible. Philemon only has about the same number of verses, but people are much keener on Philemon. It's cozier. This one is hard. This is uncomfortable. This is a code blue. This is Jude saying, contend for the faith. Well, that's the appeal in verse 3. Now we come to these certain people in verse 4. It's interesting, isn't it, that he just refers to them as certain people? Yeah, I'm sure he could have named them. For whatever reason, he chose not to. Probably a good reminder to us. This is not a personality issue. And the men that we're about to meet in verse 4 will actually be very likable people in our culture, very likable people in an evangelicalism that has become non-theological, a sort of uh, happy time for the family, raise your teens, figure out your finances, and try your best to have a nice day and be as positive as you possibly can. But whatever you do, don't start into any of this stuff. No, no. Mm -mm. No, they'll be very likable. And in fact, if you're going to take the side of Jude here, then I need you to know that you're actually going to be unpopular. Unpopular. Which is a real challenge for some of us. It's not a big challenge for me. I'm used to being unpopular. But the fact of the matter is that it is when push comes to shove. The Iron Lady is long gone. Speaking in political terms, not in spiritual terms, I wrote this down a long time ago. She said to people that she had met with, if you just set out to be liked, you would be prepared to compromise on anything at any time, and you would achieve nothing. If you simply set out to be liked, if being liked is the issue, then you're going to have to fudge on things, let go of that, agree to that, and enjoy being affirmed and recognize that actually you'll be accomplishing nothing. So the appeal is on the basis of the reason. Why are you making this appeal? Answer in verse 4, because of this internal opposition. 
surreptitiously. Crafty folks have crept in. They've crept in unnoticed. In other words, presumably these were itinerant preachers. These were people who had uh, begun to uh, make a name for themselves and uh, would be able to be attractive to uh, those who were seeking to follow the things of God. But these are infiltrators who have ingratiated themselves. By the time you get to 16, you get a flavor of that. It says that these are loudmouth boasters showing favoritism to gain their advantage. Creeps. Oh, he's a very nice person. No, she's a lovely lady. Oh, no. No, no, I think she would be very good for the Bible study. No, I think he'd be perfect. Perhaps he should become an elder. Jude is issuing a really strong warning. He's not unique in this. That's why I read from Acts 20, and that's why I want to remind you of the second letter of John, where in the course of his letter, he writes to his readers, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, that is the teaching of the faith once delivered, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. For whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. So the issue is very clear. These individuals would not be coming to the church families that he is writing to, uh, saying at uh, 11 o'clock in room 203, we're going to have a seance. No, they wouldn't. They wouldn't be saying, if you meet me in the hallway, we'll be down in the commons, and uh, as soon as we've had a coffee, uh, I'd love to read your palm, and I brought my tarot cards with me. No, that would be fairly straightforward, wouldn't it? Even the, the least theological would say, wait a minute, I don't think that's supposed to happen here. No, they won't be doing that. Now, they'll be suggesting that they ought to teach a class. They'd be ingratiating themselves in such a way that people, blind people, will not understand the disguise. But, says Jude, you should know that this will not take God by surprise. That's the second phrase there in verse 4, isn't it? These people long ago were designated for this condemnation. Or in the NIV, it says, this, this condemnation or the results of this kind of activity was written about long ago. And I think we're going to see something of what that means by the time we get, for example, to verse 11, where he's going back in time, and he says, woe to them in contemporary terms, because what they've done is walked in the way of Cain, and they've done this in relation to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. We'll have to unpack that later on when we come to it. But for the time, what he's saying is, when this occurs— don't think for a moment that God, as it were, looks over the ramparts in heaven and says, wow, how in the world? No. No, these certain persons are ungodly people. Their character will be revealed in their behavior, and their behavior will be an evidence of their beliefs. What do they do? Well, they pervert the grace of God, the grace of our God, into sensuality, one, denying our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ, two. In other words, he says, Be beneath their pious skins, they are shameless characters. Their presentation will appeal to people who are happy to go to the broadest perspective possible on what it might mean to speak of the faith. But he says, do not be don't be deceived by it, because their strategy is to replace the grace of God with license, with license. <laughs> Just in passing, when Paul is tackling the issue in Galatia, the challenge to the gospel there is legalism, saying you're not a true Christian unless you have this and this and this, unless you do this and this and this. And Paul has to write Galatians to say, stand fast in the freedom with which Christ has set you free. It is the flip side of it that is here in Jude. These people are not saying you need to tighten up. 
these people are saying you need to lighten up. In fact, when Kenneth Taylor paraphrases it, uh, the phrase here, what is it, Uh, that they perverse the grace of God into sensuality, Uh, Taylor's paraphrase says something like, they say we can do what we like without fear. We can do what we like without fear. The issue in technical terms is antinomianism. Nomos is law, anti is against. They are against any notion of the law of God. Now, the word that is used here for this sensuality is a graphic word. Aselgia, it is, in Greek. And it covers the full range of things. It's not specific. It's general. Sensuality, debauchery, sexual permissiveness, and so on. So, they, what they actually do is they take the gospel call to sinners. What is the gospel call to sinners? Come as you are right? Come as you are. You don't clean up and come. You come dirty. I'll clean you up. Come as you are. And they change that to, you can stay as you are. You can stay as you are. That's what they're saying. Oh, you can still sleep with a lady up the street. No, you can still do that. Of course you can. I mean, it might be a little tricky for a while, but there's always forgiveness. They don't worry about that kind of thing. That's what's involved here. The gospel perverted, changed into a smokescreen for immorality. Consider the collapse of largely, apparently significant evangelical pastors in the last 20 years. We don't need to go beyond that. And what's involved in it? Atzelgia, immorality, sensuality debauchery, saying to people, hey, it doesn't matter. At the worst seats in in history, temple prostitutes. It's part of the deal. Areas of the darkness of medieval Christianity bearing testimony to this and waking up in the 21st century and saying nothing has changed at all. You see, what their message is, God loves us, everything goes. That's not the grace of God. When they ask the question, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound, Romans 6, 1, the, the answer they give is yes. And Jude says, you better be really careful here. I looked for it this morning. I was excited to find it as I was rereading my notes earlier on. I said, you know, there's a great quote from Sinclair Ferguson that we got when we did his book, Devoted to God, in our elders' meeting. Here it is writing about this antinomos, we live in an antinomian world. Quotes, we frequently frequently hear that God loves us the way we are. The truth is that since the fall of Adam, God has loved only one person the way he is. We have lost sight of the fact that it is the way we are by nature that put Christ on the cross. The biblical perspective is quite different. God loves us despite the way we are. That's not just a subtle distinction. That is absolutely foundational. And that was what these folks were up against, and that is why he sounds out this note. Now, I'm not going to belabor it by going to contemporary illustrations. You can make the application yourself, and you will see how the moral and the doctrinal interface with one another. They pervert the grace of God into sensuality, they change the tune, and they deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. In other words, they do what we're tempted to do, and that is change our view of God to fit our immoral choices. <laughs> we, I mean, I either confronted by the truth of God's Word, I have to bow down underneath it and say, Jesus is my master, and He is my Lord, and He's my King, and I don't have an option, or I have to reconfigure somehow or another. I've got to go somewhere where somebody tells me, no, this is perfectly okay. You see, the great threat 
to the authority of Scripture comes not only by, you know, the addition of dogma in any form, but also probably the great challenge to the authority of the Scriptures in your life and mine is the authority of our experience. I know God says it's wrong, but I'm sure He understands. After all, it just feels so right. If I had a dollar for every time I had somebody in my study explaining that this was the reason that they were leaving their married marriage partner, I'd be pretty rich. I know God says it's wrong, but I'm sure He won't mind. After all, it just feels so right. The bottom line is this, that we have no—I'll have to come back to this—but we have, we have no basis at all. If we're genuine Christians, we have no freedom to believe anything other than what Jesus taught. What Jesus taught, He then uh, gave to His apostles. The apostles then wrote it down in the Scriptures. They not only gave the revelation of who Jesus is and what He has done, but they gave the interpretation of that revelation. Christ died. Revelation for sins, interpretation, according to the gospel, explanation. We have no right to believe anything other than Jesus taught, and we have no freedom to behave in any other way than what He demands. How crazy would we be to step outside the borders of Christ's protective love? It's because He loves us so much that He wants to hold us together in that way. Well, Jude the shepherd can't sit idly by and watch the invasion and destruction of the flock. He offers not helpful advice, but a strong, striking, prophetic word from God through him to the saints, urging them to wake up and contend for the faith. a necessary message, I think. Father, thank you for your word. Help us not to make application of this that takes us beyond the boundaries of our own lives. We are susceptible to denying you as our master. We routinely seem to find it intriguing that we might be able to just minimize some of your straightforward demands in order that we might be able to justify our experience. Lord, grant that in tackling these issues or being tackled by these issues, that we may have the gentleness and meekness of Christ, and yet the boldness of those who took their stand in their day. We hear you say to us, wake up, get up, get on. And we pray in Christ's name. 